my voice still isn't perfect, but I think it's serviceable. I hope you can understand me. I want to start, uh, of course, by thanking uh, Lindo uh, for the invitation to come here and to congratulate him and the entire team uh, for the extraordinary show that they've put on. <clears throat> These kind of events are not easy, but they're incredibly valuable. And actually, I think the format that Arlindo has adopted for this, with the short talks and lots of discussion, is just fabulous. I'm a, a technical diver, a photographer, an explorer, just like many of you, but I never get to talk about my adventures. Because I'm a physician and a scientist, I always get asked to talk about the things that can go wrong. But that's okay, too, because I'm actually very passionate about those things. I think that the physiology and medicine of what we do is part of what attracts us to the activity. It's all part of the adventure, and I enjoy talking about that. And today, my subject is in-water recompression. And I'll bet you there's not a single one of you who's a diver for any length of time <clears throat> who hasn't been asked, if you get decompression sickness, why don't you just get back in the water and treat it there? That's what I'm going to talk about today. So four years ago, hello, Earth calling control system. I'm pretty sure I'm pushing the right button. Oh, there we go. Um, four years ago, I was part of an international panel that was tasked with reviewing the strategies that we use in pre-hospital management for decompression illness. And we considered a whole variety of subjects in water recompression was only one of them. However, one of the questions we were asked to address was, is it time for the medical profession to endorse in water recompression? And if so, <clears throat> by who and for who? And it might not surprise you to hear that until that time, the medical profession had been very negative about the concept of in-water recompression. And I would ask you to reflect on why it is that the, uh, the medical profession did have such a big problem. If I'm going to have to press this about six times each time I want to advance a slide, it's going to be problematic. Anyway, oh, by the way, uh, the one thing I will do as a uh, as an explorer like you guys is th put some of my photographs in here. So this is from the Poor Nights Islands in New Zealand where I dive a lot. So why did the medical profession have such a big problem with in-water recompression? And I, look, I think the answer is fairly obvious. That's too, there we go. <clears throat> the answer is there are risks. The obvious ones are oxygen toxicity. If you go back in the water after a long dive, breathing oxygen, there's a small risk of having a seizure. The environment can be hazardous. You could get cold, for example. The diver could deteriorate in the water. They could get worse. Obviously, it will delay getting to a chamber. And it can occur in settings without medical support. Indeed, it usually does. But there are also potential benefits. And... <laughs> And that the key, the key benefit is very early recompression. And that has a perceived advantage to it. And I'll come to that in a moment. And also, obviously, we can recompress someone in the water when a chamber is just simply not available. There's no realistic possibility of getting to a chamber. Now, this comment may surprise you, but the benefit of very early recompression if you go looking for the evidence that that is so, it's actually quite hard to find. All of you have been taught that the sooner you get to a chamber, the better. And, and I agree with that. However, if you look for the data, it's actually quite difficult to find. <laughs> so whereas we always try to balance risks and benefits and take the path of least risk for our patients. The point about in-water recompression is that the benefits were essentially unproven. So as part of that project four years ago, myself and David Dulet, who's a colleague who works for 
Naval Experimental Diving Unit in Panama City, Florida, we took on this task of looking specifically at in-water recompression. And this was published in a separate paper, which is available online for free at this address. So you can look it up on PubMed Central. And in our project, we tried to answer two questions. The first question was, does very early recompression actually improve outcome? Now, you know, you think you know the answer to that, but I don't think that the data were very good until we undertook this. So does it improve outcome? And can a shorter, shallower recompression than we can achieve in a hyperbaric chamber actually work? Does it help cure decompression illness? So what I want to do now first is take you through the answers to those two questions. The first question was, does very early recompression improve outcome? That's the Admiral's cabin in the Saratoga at Bikini Atoll. That's Pete Mesley in that photo. So this is the sort of data that is out there available prior to us or was out there available prior to us undertaking this project. There are other studies that are similar, but this is representative of what we knew prior to four years ago. So this is a, a study by Jean-Éric Blateau, his French group, uh, 279 cases of spinal decompression sickness. So these are serious cases. And what he's done is stratified them according to delay to recompression. So less than three hours, three to six hours, greater than six hours. And this is the percentage of cases that made a full recovery at the end of the hyperbaric treatments. And less than three hours, 76%. Three to six hours, actually more got better, but that's just statistical noise. And then greater than six hours, 63%. So you could convince yourself that there's an inflection somewhere around six hours where your outcome's less likely to be good. But those data, I'm sure you would agree with me that those data do not make a strong case for early recompression being better. However, there's a problem with these data and all the other data that were out there at the same time. And that is that this less than three hour category would mainly have been divers that presented very close to three hours. They probably don't, they probably don't contain many examples of divers that presented very early because no one does to a chamber. I mean, you know, it always takes time to get to a chamber. So what about less than an hour or less than 30 minutes? So we went looking for data that answered that question. What about if you recompress really early? And the great thing about working with David <clears throat> is that he has access to these big databases of dives, US Navy experimental dives, where they were designing dive tables, and they actually do cause decompression sickness in their subjects. But because their subjects in an experiment, they have a chamber right there, the moment they get symptoms, they go in the chamber. So very early recompression. Now, this data set was actually available, but it was in a very obscure publication, and it described 166 cases in US Navy experimental dives, decompression sickness arriving after back at the, arriving at the, after arriving at the surface, and there was little or no delay between symptom occurrence and treatment, as you'd expect. And they showed that 72% of these cases resolved during the compression, not during the entire treatment, but as the chamber was being compressed. So really quickly, 97% resolved during the first recompression and all of them got better eventually. Now those numbers are very different to the numbers I just showed you on that slide for civilian divers with longer delays I just showed you before. And we actually reported another data set of previously unreported cases, about another 150 cases that were almost identical to this. I'm not going to show you in the sake of, for the sake of time, but what we found was the answer to this question. So does very early recompression improve outcome? I think we can reasonably confidently say on the basis of hard data, the answer is yes. <clears throat> So the second question is, does a shorter, shallow recompression work 
especially if it started early. Now, uh, this photo is from a recent expedition to the subantarctic that I went on over last summer. It's one of the New Zealand, beautiful New Zealand sea lions interacting with you in the way that Alan described this morning. Now, many of you will know that this, the fairly standard approach to treating decompression illness in a hyperbaric chamber is the so-called US Navy Table 6. I'm not going to walk you through it except to say that the initial compression is to 2.8 atmospheres or 18 meters seawater equivalent, breathing 100% oxygen. You can't do that in the water. It's too dangerous. The risk of oxygen toxicity in the water is way higher than it is in a hyperbaric chamber. So you can't do that. The question is, does something shallower and shorter than that actually work? Now, I didn't know this until David pointed it out, but in the 1960s, when they were developing that table, the US Navy experimented with shallower, shorter recompressions in chambers, but the sort of recompressions you could do in the water. Uh, this is one of the wrecks at Truck. I, I forget which it is, actually. Um, you probably know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what it is. Well done. So in the, the documentation around the development of the Table 6, you can find a record of 31 cases. It's a small data set, but 31 cases of experimental dive decompression sickness that was recompressed to 10 metres for 30 minutes and then decompressed over 30 minutes. That was the treatment the divers received. <clears throat> 25 of those recovered completely and two had substantial resolution and the others needed more treatment. The point there, there is that this very early short shallow recompression did work. So does a shorter shallow recompression work, especially if it started early? Small data set, but I think uh, and we can add to that quite a lot of anecdote around the use of in-water recompression that's out there in the literature. I think we can say that the answer is yes, mostly it does. And so on the basis of those two questions being answered, in that consensus guideline that we published in 2018, for the first time, and this had not happened before, the medical community cautiously endorsed in water recompression with caveats. So what, what are those caveats? Well, what I want to do is take you through this algorithm that we put together for in water recompression. And, and some of those issues will come out as we work through this. So the first question is who? This is a beautiful reef, uh, reef area in the Coral Sea off Australia, a place called Osprey Reef. It's 70 meters, it's unbelievable. The color that's down there is extraordinary. So who would you recompress in water? What we did was we split, we adopted a, uh, a grading system for separating out decompression illness into very broad categories. And we said we would treat tier two or tier three type patients. Now, what does that mean? Well, you wouldn't use in water recompression for symptoms that are very mild, and non-specific, which is to say that they could be caused by lots of other things. So for example, someone who just feels tired after a dive or has a headache, and there's so many things that can cause that, and it's common. So you wouldn't recompress someone in water for that. You could consider in water recompression if someone had tier two, which is the so-called mild decompression sickness symptoms, or tier three, the more serious ones, the more the neurological symptoms. So those are the sorts of patients you would consider it for. The next question is, is a recompression chamber close enough that you wouldn't bother with in-water recompression? And somewhat arbitrarily, we chose two hours as the cutoff point. So if a recompression chamber is more than two hours away, you would continue down the in-water recompression pathway. If it's not, so if you've got a close chamber, you'd go to that chamber. The other question you can ask is, is the decompression illness stable? So if you've got progressive symptoms, even if you've got a chamber moderately close by, if you if you all the rest of these 
uh, considerations you might forge ahead with in-water recompression. So the next question is, are there any contraindications? So reasons why you can't do it. And so what are the contraindications to in-water recompression? Well, one is severe vertigo. So in an air decompression illness, you probably would not treat in a in an in-water situation because the patient's just too unwell to go back in the water. Obviously, as someone who's unconscious, or if their their level of consciousness is deteriorating, you would not take them in the water. We also specified oxygen toxicity as part of the preceding events. So if someone was, say, decompressing from a technical dive, had a seizure, came to the surface quickly, and then got decompression sickness, you probably wouldn't want to put them back in the water on oxygen because they've already had a seizure and their risk might be quite high. If they're so sick or physically incapacitated that returning them to the water would be unsafe, clearly you wouldn't do it. And obviously the patient has to be willing. They have to want it. The next question is, is the team willing, trained, and equipped? And of all the things, this is probably the most important one. So these are the things that we thought were really important to have if you're going to do in-water recompression. So the patient themselves, a buddy who must accompany them at all times, and a surface supervisor must all be trained to decompression procedures or above. Why? Because when you do that training, you are taught how to use oxygen, how to use oxygen safely, what you need to use oxygen in the water. In other words, the patient is an informed risk acceptor because they understand the risks of using oxygen in the water. The people treating the patient know how to do it safely. In other words, this is not something that your average dive master can just put up a sign on the side of their dive boat and say, in water recompression offered here. It has to be the right qualified, the right qualified people. You need adequate oxygen. I won't dig into that, but rebreathers are a very good way of doing that. You should have a shot line or stage. So something that the diver can sit on, be clipped onto, that's supported by. So that's okay, but free swimming within water recompression is a big no-no. And finally, we strongly recommended airway protection of some sort. And there is some recent evidence that supports the use of airway protective devices in the water that we did not have not that long ago. So one form of airway protection, uh, why airway protection? Just in case the diver goes unconscious, has a seizure, you would need to bring them to the surface, but you don't want them to drown while you're doing that. So one form is a mouthpiece retainer. This is a photo of me, and it's a bit hard to see, but I'm wearing one of the Draga mouthpiece retainers as a strap that goes around the back of your head. It pulls a flange in around your lips that has the mouthpiece attached to it, and it keeps the mouthpiece in place and helps seal it in your mouth. Now, there is some skepticism about whether these really work, but there is some evidence that they do. So this is a study published 10 years ago now by the same French group I mentioned before. They looked at rebreather diving incidents over 40 years in the French Navy. And over that period, there were 54 loss of consciousness events. Every single one of those divers was wearing a Draga mouthpiece retaining device. And out of those 54 loss of consciousness events, there were only three drownings. Now, as a diving physician who's seen the results of lots of loss of consciousness events in the water, my opinion is that if you had 54 loss of consciousness events, you'll have more than three drownings. So there is evidence here that something they're doing is protective. And I think those mouthpiece retainers are an important part of that. The next thing, of course, is well, what about full face masks? Now, Rebreather Forum 3 about 10 years ago or eight years ago, they identified as a research priority the, the idea that we might somehow test whether full face masks can protect your airway and your breathing if you were unconscious underwater. There was never any real expectation that that would truly be tested because what ethics committee is going to allow you to make people unconscious, stick a full face mask on them and put them underwater? 
Of course, that sounds ridiculous, right? But then this happened. And, and you all know what I'm talking about, the Thailand event. So this is my good friend and colleague, Richard Harris. He's anesthetized this young man um, with ketamine. He's deeply unconscious, as they all were. I've put a full face mask on him. And uh, they're putting the tank on, strapping it on as a keel. And hey, you, look, you know the story. Each one of those boys was swum out, deeply unconscious. And history will record that all of those children and their coach were taken through a, uh, about 1.2 kilometers of flooded cave under very difficult conditions with ketamine anesthesia and not a single one of them drowned. There wasn't even, I oh, know, I like it as it's awesome. There's not even any evidence that they aspirated water. They all had chest x-rays when they got out. This is uh, Richard's slightly, slightly unconventional needle disposal system over here on this side. Any nurses or doctors in here would uh, write oh, about that. Um, the mask they chose was the Interspiro Divator full face mask. It was trialed with some kids in a local swimming pool by the American group that were there. They chose that mask because it has allegedly has a what the manufacturer calls a safety pressure function. So it maintains a degree of positive pressure inside the mask relative to outside the mask even when you're inhaling, which creates negative pressure inside the mask. Now, I, as a, as a skeptical scientist, I have a long history of having found manufacturers' claims that actually aren't true. So we decided to test this. Um, and uh, again, this is a paper that you can all download for free. It's on PubMed Central. If you're interested in the Thailand Cave Rescue, this is the only publication that describes the anesthetic in any detail, but it also contains this test that we did on the mask. Um, so we got some of these masks, we put a paddling pool in our lab, uh, it caused a few problems with um, health, health and safety in the building, but um, well, the reason we had to do it in the lab was that we needed very sensitive pressure measurement equipment right next to the pool. And we measured the pressure with the diver, you know, flat in the water, face in the water, pressure inside the mask and outside the mask while they were taking breaths. And this is what we showed. So this is the water pressure, the red line's the water pressure, the black line is the mask pressure. And as you can see that when it was connected to an open circuit pressurized gas supply during inhalation, which is the low point and exhalation, which is the high point, it maintained a pressure in the mask higher than the surrounding water all the time, even when you were taking big breaths. It didn't do that on a back-mounted rebreather. And that's not a criticism. The manufacturer never claimed that it would because there's no pressurized gas supply, so it can't maintain positive pressure. So just bear in mind that it doesn't provide that protection on a rebreather, but it certainly does on open circuit. The next thing is, do you have a suitable environment? And look, you know, there's lots of things that would come into that. What time of day is it? What's is the water rough? What's the water temperature? Are the, is, are the divers going to get hypothermia? And there are ways what, that you can mitigate many of those things. The temperature is a big one for some of our stuff. Bill Stone mentioned the Pierce resurgence that we're exploring at the moment. Uh, last uh, 2020, when we went there, Richard and Craig went down to 245 meters, 16 hour dive in six degree water, so pretty cold. And we had habitats in there. So this is one of the habitats. This is the 16 meter one. We had one at six meters. The purpose of the habitats was decompression primarily, but had we needed to do in-water recompression, we could also have used the habitats and that would have helped us get around the safety issues. And then finally, if the answer to, you know, do you have a suitable environment is yes, then you can go ahead with in-water recompression. And I'm not going to describe algorithms. There's a bunch of them out there, but look, it can be as simple as what I showed you that the US Navy did in testing for the table six. Go down to 10 meters, stay there for half an hour, come back up. Go down to 10 meters, stay there for an hour, come back up. That tends to be what we have done when we've done in-water recompression. And look, just to reinforce this concept that this is now out there, this is a paper that I published with two of my colleagues um, in the world's most influential medical journal 
just six months ago. And we actually codified in-water recompression in there. So it basically says that, however, published evidence of the efficacy of a short, shallow recompression at approximately 10 meters administered very early an experience from the 2018 Thailand cave rescue showing that careful management and use of a full face mask can protect the airway if a diver becomes unconscious have provided the basis for qualified endorsement of in-water recompression with the use of oxygen by divers with appropriate equipment and training. So it's there, it's endorsed. It's not for everyone. It's for people like many of the technical divers in this room who know how to use oxygen safely. So uh, just another New Zealand photograph. That's actually David Dulette there in the photo. Um, what we now have is evidence that the benefits really are real. Very early recompression works. We also have evidence that some of these risks can be mitigated by the use of proper equipment. So in conclusion, short delays to recompression seem associated with better outcomes. Recompressions shorter and shallower than a US Navy Table 6 do work. And in-water recompression is endorsed by the medical community for divers trained in the use of oxygen underwater and equipped properly for in-water recompression. That's uh, the photo of our 40 meter and 30 meter habitats in the Pierce Resurgence 2020. So we'll be configuring the cave very similarly when we go back there uh, in February in 2023 uh, to try and push it a little bit further. Thank you very much.